In this exercise, the small external fixator will be used for the fixation of a supracondylar distal humerus fracture, AO types 13 M 3.1, 3, and 4. Upon completion of this exercise, you should be able to explain the indications for the use of the small external fixator in cases of pediatric supracondylar fracture fixation. Recognize the importance of functional postoperative treatment. Explain the correct and safe insertion points for shunts screws. Describe the advantages and disadvantages of this fixation technique. Explain strategies for avoiding complications. And explain the need and importance of the anti rotation K wire. The clinical indications include difficulty in obtaining closed anatomical reduction, for example in long oblique fractures, difficulty in obtaining stable pin configuration, primary or secondary vascular problems, which may require open exploration, revision of secondarily displaced or imperfectly reduced fractures until 14 days post-injury, and fracture patterns with absent posterior periosteal stability, flexion type fracture. If K wires can be used to maintain position, then anatomical closed reduction and pinning is preferred. The advantages are there is no need for casting or splinting, there is no need for open reduction. Early functional rehabilitation is possible and it allows easier monitoring for compartment syndrome. The disadvantages of the technique are there is a risk of radial nerve damage if the proximal shunt screw is inserted too proximal and a risk of pin track infection. In this case, the seven year old child fell from a tree. The AP and lateral X-rays show a multifragmentary supracondylar fracture of the distal humerus, AO pediatric classification 13-M slash 3.23. This unstable fracture could not be managed using a K-wire fixation technique. A closed reduction and radial external fixation using the small external fixator were indicated. The post-operative x-rays show perfect axial alignment of the distal humerus. The six weeks follow-up images show that the range of motion and axis are normal. Removal of the external fixator is permitted. The seven weeks follow-up x-rays show complete healing. The external fixator is removed. An application of a plaster cast is not necessary. The patient is positioned supine on the operating table with the arm prone. After reduction has been achieved, the arm should be moved as little as possible. Images should be obtained by rotating the C-arm and not moving the arm. The instruments required for reduction and fixation are the Schanz screws 3.0 to 4.0 mm diameter, the rod, 4.0 mm diameter, the clip-on clamp, the T-wrench, the adapter for shunts screw, 4.0 mm diameter, the quick coupling chuck, and the K-wire, 2.0 mm diameter, which will be used to prevent rotation of the distal fragment at the fracture site. In a clinical situation, the proximal fracture level is identified under image intensification with the help of a K-wire. Using this line for reference, the safe level for screw insertion is 1.5 to 2 cm proximal to the fracture level. More proximal insertion can damage the radial nerve. Clinically, a 1 to 1.5 cm skin incision is made at the planned insertion point 
and deepened by blunt dissection with a small artery forceps until the lateral border of the humerus can be felt. The chosen shunt's screw is inserted manually onto the anterolateral surface of the humerus and then connected with the drill. Drilling is started slowly, perpendicular to the humeral surface. When the screw has obtained good purchase, the drill is tilted so that the screw is inserted parallel to the posterior aspect of the humerus and perpendicular to the humeral axis. In a clinical situation, once the shunt's screw has been inserted to approximately two-thirds of the humeral diameter, the proximal humerus is rotated together with the drill into a true AP view to check the length of insertion of the shunt's screw. The screw is then advanced to just pierce the medial cortex. Using the forearm as a joystick, the elbow, together with the distal humeral fragment, is manipulated until a true lateral projection of the capitellum is obtained. The center of the capitellum is then identified. Lines are drawn along the radial shaft axis and through the center of the capitellum. The intersection of these two lines is the correct insertion point for the distal shunt's screw. If a metaphyseal fragment is large enough, the distal shunt's screw can be inserted above the physis parallel to the joint line. Clinically, a 0.5 to 1 cm skin incision is made at the planned insertion point and deepened by blunt dissection with a small artery forceps until the lateral aspect of the distal fragment can be felt. In a clinical situation, the position is checked using image intensification. The screw is then inserted 1 to 2 centimeters. In a clinical situation, the fragment is rotated into a true AP view using the shunt's screw and drill and the parallel alignment of the screw in relation to the joint surface is verified. The shunt's screw is inserted almost to the medial aspect of the distal fragment. The medial aspect should never be pierced. If no bony contact can be felt between the fragments, any entrapped soft tissue can be released by manipulating the shunt's screws under gentle traction. If the proximal shunt's screw has been inserted perpendicularly to the humeral axis and the distal shunt's screw is parallel to the joint, the fracture will be virtually aligned when the shunt's screws are parallel to each other. The clamps are attached to the shunt's screws so that the body of the clamp does not obscure radiological control of the fracture in the lateral view. The two clamps are connected using a short 4.0 mm rod and tightened provisionally to enable the fragments to be moved. With the proximal fragment in a true AP view, the distal fragment is manipulated until a satisfactory orientation is obtained. With the upper arm held firmly and the elbow at 90 degrees, pulling along the axis of the forearm causes flexion and pushing causes extension of the distal fragment. Using these maneuvers, a correct alignment can be achieved. Once the reduction is achieved, the clamps are fully tightened. To prevent rotation of the distal fragment around the shunt's screw at the fracture site, a 2.0 mm K-wire is inserted from the distal lateral aspect, posterior to the distal shunt's screw, towards the proximal medial cortex of the humerus, ending anterior to the proximal screw. The function of the anti-rotation K-wire is seen here. The distal fragment is well secured and can no longer be rotated. In this exercise, the K-wire is trimmed using the cutter for titanium elastic nail, but usually it can be trimmed with an ordinary K-wire cutter. 
the protruding end of the wire is bent towards the fixator. This prevents patient's soft tissue injury in a post-operative period. Clinically, after definitive fixation, the stability and axial alignment must be checked radiologically. The following parameters must be identical to the contralateral side. The carrying angle of the arm, elbow flexion and extension, and forearm pronation and supination. You should now be able to explain the indications for the use of the small external fixator in cases of pediatric supracondylar fracture fixation, recognize the importance of functional postoperative treatment, explain the correct and safe insertion points for shunts screws, Describe the advantages and disadvantages of this fixation technique, explain strategies for avoiding complications, and explain the need and importance of the anti-rotation K-wire.